Hey folks, my name is Kevin and it's time for a little bit more knife nerdery and today we're gonna to be taking a semi-small details look at this wicked blade, sorry, at this brand new pocket knife from a brand new pocket knife company, but one that's founded by someone who is not at all new to knives. So this is the Contact by Beyond EDC, or you could say it's by Asymmetrical and we'll talk all about what that means and that branding confusion in just a minute. Now this is not going to be a full small details review because this is an Apex Pass Around Group knife. So huge thank you to Blade Banner for organizing this whole thing and for making it so that folks like me can show knives like this to folks like you. The consequence of that though is that I've only had this for about a week. I'm not allowed to do any meaningful cutting with it because I'm not allowed to do anything that's going to risk uh, changing the overall condition of the knife. Uh, so I've done only minor cutting with it and I'm also not allowed to get it apart, but we are still going to get pretty darn nerdy. And this is a cool knife. So let's back up for a moment. I said this is by a company called Beyond EDC. That's a brand new production knife company by a guy named David Sun. You may or may not recognize that name. If you don't, I'm not terribly surprised because he's always been working behind the scenes, but he's been in the knife production company world, that whole industry for quite some time now. He started his own knife company way back in the day, but he switched to working with Kaiser when they first came to the US in 2012. He's then kind of worked with everyone. Man, he's he's worked from going from Kaiser to Cold Steel, from Cold Steel to Artisan, from Artisan to Reich, Reich to Wii, and now he's doing Beyond EDC. He said that his reasoning for doing that was because he wanted to, you know, focus on bringing high quality knives at a great value to the cut, all that kind of stuff that people always say. I think if we're being realistic, the reason why he started his own company, because he spent the last 10 years helping other people run their company, saw how to do it and figured he could do it on his own. Um, he's not a knife designer and he's not uh, a knife maker of his, um, his own, but he knows a lot about how this stuff works and how knife companies actually are run. And so he's a really interesting guy to hear talk. There's a, a great Knife Nights podcast interview with him. So if you want to hear more about him, how the industry works or, or this company, go check that out. I highly encourage it. Now, Beyond EDC makes their own knives. They own their own factories. It's not that David owns knife factories, but he created the company as a partnership with people who own two knife production factories that have been making knives for other people for a very long time. So they know what they're doing. I don't know what other companies they've made the knives for, but I I don't think it's surprising that, that uh, David had a long history with Kaiser. And to me, this knife feels a lot like Kaiser. So this is the Kaiser G. Show that right there. This is the evolution of the Kaiser Genie. And if we just look at these handles, the, the way that the milling is done, the finishing of everything, the amount and style of, of skeletonization inside, these knives feel tremendously similar to me. Now, I don't know who makes Kaiser's knives. I don't know if they own their own factories. A thing that a lot of people don't realize is if you buy a knife from a company over in China, even if sometimes they own their own factories, but even then, sometimes they'll farm out parts of production or even whole knives to a whole bunch of other factories that they just work with. And even companies that are themselves OEMs like Best Tech do that same thing. Best Tech is more of a a logistics company that partners with a bunch of knife factories. So honestly, I have no idea who else he's made for, but I think this is a pretty favorable and fair comparison. And I think that the quality here is pretty good. Now, as far as branding goes, I said there's a bit of brand confusion and I know that I'm kind of getting into the weeds here, but okay. So this, the company's called Beyond EDC and I'm going to say it right off the bat. It, I find it kind of obnoxious because it's spelled B-Y-O-N-D. There's an apostrophe there, but the E is not there. I always find that kind of naming a little bit obnoxious. It's called Beyond EDC. That's the name of the overall umbrella company, but it's also the name of one of their product lines. And the thing is, is it gets a little bit more confusing than that because sometimes they refer to them as product lines and sometimes they refer to them as standalone brands. So they have a product line at the base called Beyond EDC, and that's where they have their budget line. And that's where you get D2 and, and G10 and that kind of stuff. It, um, then they have this thing in the middle. And this, they're, they're, it's, it's in the middle because they have a, a tier even above it, but it's really kind of like their high-end pieces. And it's called asymmetrical. That name also a little bit bugs me because generally speaking, you want a knife to be pretty symmetrical for it to operate well, but whatever, it's just a name. Um, the thing is, is asymmetrical is sometimes again referred to as a brand. Like if you buy this knife, it comes in a box that says asymmetrical. Uh, the branding there says all asymmetrical. The product number is ASM for asymmetrical. This 
insert here, and that says asymmetrical. Uh, this even refers to it asymmetrical brand. The only place anywhere on this that they say beyond EDC, they don't have that name or logo anywhere, is the fact that they have this URL right here. But okay, this is again, kind of muddied. So I said that the official name of the company is B apostrophe Y O N D, but their website is B E Y O N D. And the thing is, they don't own the version of this without the E. So you can't actually spell this the way that the name of the brand is actually spelled and get to their website. And that, that bugs the heck out of me. Also, if you go on their website, like the URL is spelled like this, the product description pages spell it like this, but the actual logo and everything spells it without the E. The whole thing just feels slightly like a brand that's still in its infancy. I mean, and it, it is, but it, it, it feels that way, like a brand that hasn't quite solidified how it wants to present itself to the world. Uh, but so asymmetrical is where mid-range lines, where you get stuff with uh, titanium handles, S35VN, stuff like that. And then they do have a line above it called Terra Mundi. And Terra Mundi is roughly Latin for the world. That's how they translate it. It literally means like the, the like the domain of the earth, like the world of the earth. So now those are gonna have a little bit of material upgrade. You're going from S35VN to M390, but the bigger thing is those are going to be limited and numbered. There's only been two of them so far. And even there, there's a little bit of kind of branding confusion where the logos that they've done are really, really fundamentally different from each other. But anyway, I said those are gonna be limited and numbered and they come with a CO COA card. One of the things that's really cool is that those COA cards are hand signed by the designer of the knives. That's that's a, a nice a nice little small detail that does make them feel more personal. It's not that those things are never going to be redone ever and they're never going to release another version of the knife. It's just there's never going to be released in the same colorway or materials. There's, there'll be something substantively different if they do another round. They'll make yours still special. Now I just said the designer of the knife. If you go into their intro level, uh, Beyond EDC and Asymmetrical, those are gonna have some stuff that's designed in-house and some stuff that they're partnering with designers. At the Terramundi level, they're all done by designers. Now, at those earlier two levels, at both of them, there are knives designed by this right here. This is the maker mark for Dirk Pinkerton. And so if you don't know who Dirk Pinkerton is, he is a custom knife maker. He's been doing it since 2005. If you don't have one of his customs, there's a decent odds that you either have, or at least have seen one of his many production knives because he's partnered with a lot of brands. He has licensed knives through Kaiser, Artisan, Meyerco, Concept, a lot of overseas brands. Now his background before getting into knife making was in um, private security. And so his kind of general interest and focus area is in self-defense and combat knives. And that's not a use case that I have or an interest of mine. So that part doesn't really appeal to me, but he also does a lot of knives in Warncliffe and reverse tanto shapes that do appeal to me. He does that in part because there is overlap in front with that kind of you know, self-defense space, but also his general, like his literal motto is knives designed with a purpose. And to me, in my world, what that means is utility knives. And that is exactly what Horncliffe's, anything with a, a, a low tip blade is used for. Cause this type of thing is perfect for that kind of box cutting, utility cutting on a surface type cutting that I do all the freaking time. So I quite like the look of some of his knives. And in particular, this looks really, yeah, man, this is a really cool looking knife. It is kind of an aggressive looking knife. They say on the website that this is intended to be a reinterpretation or a modern reinterpretation of a, of a classic Indo-Persian Pesh cobs. Now that's a, a old school dagger type knife specifically designed for piercing armor. And so they're very, very pointy. Those often are not reverse tantos, but whatever, it doesn't really matter. The point is that this is meant to be a pointy knife. And let's just start talking about this blade because, yeah, it's, it's designed after a knife that's designed for piercing, and it will certainly pierce with this tip. But the thing is, is that this blade stock is thick enough. It's not super thick. It's 0.1375 or 3.5 millimeters, but it's thick enough, and it remains thick enough out here that this is actually a pretty sturdy tip. Now, what that means is it's gonna pierce about as well as you expect. Like it'll certainly start entering, but if you're piercing into something that is uh, dense, like double walled cardboard, it's gonna start wedging really pretty quickly with this amount of meat up here. But it also means that this tip is not um, dainty at all. You, I wouldn't recommend that you pry with any knife, really, unless it's specifically designed for that, and some are. Uh, but I don't think you would risk bending this tip unless you're doing something really, really stupid. 
Now, talking about that over again, overall, now, like I said, this is uh, 0.1375 blade stock. And the, the thing about this is that it, the grind is just not all that tall. It's it's not that that's terribly thick, but you'd want, I at least I personally would want a slightly taller grind on something like that, because this is just over half an inch, 0.6 inches. So even though this gets pretty thin behind the edge, it's 18 thousandths behind the edge, it doesn't have a whole lot of distance for that to thicken back up to this full blade stock up here. And so this is... Well, this is just kind of a wedge, you know? It's it's just not a super slicing knife. Now, I also don't think it's designed to be a super slicing knife. It's designed to be more of a, a, a sturdy utilitarian work knife in that regard. So great. I think it's going to achieve that quite well. I, I personally tend to want a slicer knife, and so this isn't a blade that's really, really well uh, suited for my particular needs. Talking about that behind the edge thickness, though. So I said this is 18,000 back here, and this is 137 up here. So the plunge here is actually done really, really well. The plunge is the thing that takes it from that full blade stock down to the thinnest behind the edge. And you can see that this one here is not the kind that's like really all that concave. It's kind of just a singular plane, but it ends right there, which is nice because it means you have this entire distance for sharpening before you'll hit that plunge and start getting a smile. As I pointed out earlier, though, this is a pretty uh, steep grind incline though. So even though you're not going to be hitting the plunge, it does thicken up pretty quickly. And what that means is that you probably don't want to put a super uh, a a low angle edge on this, something like in the 15 to 17 degree range, because you're, you're going to end up getting a really thick bevel once you start going further up this blade. But again, I don't think this knife is really intended to have a thin slicey edge on it. I think this is meant to be a more of a robust user. Now, uh, the last thing I want to say about that cutting performance, like, uh, so I did push this through single and double walled cardboard a bunch of times and not enough to really, whatever. Anyway, the point is, is that this knife is actually very, very comfortable to put a lot of force on. There are these nice little chamfers along the way the entire time. And this is thick enough that you can put a lot of pressure with your thumb on this and it doesn't hurt at all. It's easy to do that. And this handle has nothing really in the way of hot spots, And so it's, it's actually quite comfortable to put a lot of force in. So even if you do have to put more force, because it's kind of a wedgie knife, I think you can do that just fine. The other thing I would want to talk about with this blade is this jimping. I think they did a very, very nice job with this jimping. It's a longer stretch than you find on a lot of knives, and I love to see that. A lot of knives will kind of end right in this little zone right there, which really only works if you're in this one particular grip. But this is up here enough, which means if you can't the knife backward like that, and especially so if you're going to be putting a lot of force down, you want to be able to put your thumb further up, you still get to contact with that jimping. It also works even in a pinch grip all the way up there. This is kind of the way that like Vox tends to be as nice will put his strip just up here and so this is actually my favorite where it's just a long strip and I, I I only like that though if it's good jimping and this is really really nicely done it's shallow enough that and and the uh the crests are wide enough that it doesn't hurt at all to push on you can push on this with a lot of force and it's not going to dig into your finger it's quite comfortable but these edges are crisp enough that it catches you immediately and so yeah I think the jimping is done very very well here so the other thing I wanted to say about uh, pressure and everything like that, I want to talk about ergos and grips later, but it's very comfortable having this full thickness up here and putting a lot of force down into a cut. You you do need to put a little bit more force if you're cutting through something that's more than like a single sheet, but I found that doing utility cuts with this and being able to put all my pressure right up there at the tip worked quite well. So let's come back to these handles. These handles are done in uh, TC4 titanium. That's what most titanium handles coming out of China are going to be made in. If, if you're not familiar with it, that's basically the Chinese version of a, uh, 6AL4V. They're not exactly the same, but they're both considered grade five titaniums. Um, <clears throat> I, I think the handles here are really, really nicely done. Partly, it's just an aesthetic thing. I think this knife overall has a very strong aesthetic that ties in really nicely. I think the angularity of the blade and the size and thickness of everything really mirrors well the angularity of the handle. This is one of those three-paneled knives that's kind of reminiscent of the 520 or the Vero knives. And this is actually one of my favorite ways of doing contouring because you get a lot, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the, the, the lack of hard corners and the kind of like hand filling quality of contouring, but you also get the same kind of indexing you get with, uh, with, with flat slab handles. What I mean by indexing is that when I hold it in my hand, because you can feel where you are on these panels, you immediately know how it's positioned in your hand. You know, if it's rotated at all, it's also easy to prevent it from rotating because it's not going to slide out from under you. So I actually really, really love the way these handles feel in my hand. They're, um, 
they're just under half an inch thick. This is 0.4955 or something like that. And so this is thin enough that it still feels good in my pocket and also in my hand, but it's thick enough that it really does fill out my hand. Overall, I think this just feels really, really nice. Let's talk about this, this milling and jimping. So they've got the this micro milling this entire way. And I, I think it looks really, really cool, especially as it curves up and wraps around those things. It goes on front and back. It does provide a small amount of traction. It's not um, it's not like real full on jimping, but it does, especially in something like a pinch grip, kind of lock you in right there. I'll talk about ergos again in just a little moment, uh, but let's talk about this jimping, these, these the, the thing that I'm going to call jimping, it doesn't actually extend to the top, so it's not going to provide traction at, if you put your thumb all the way back here. I don't know why you would hold the knife like that, but you will kind of slide. It's only going to provide traction if you were kind of at an angle and actually pressing into this. And so I think this stuff up here is honestly largely for show. I do really like, it only happens on the one, but I do really like that this jimping line right there lines up with that jimping line lines up with that. On the back of the knife, it's, uh, it makes a little bit more of an impact in two different ways. So this up here uh, does actually provide additional traction in a pinch grip, and this back here does actually provide additional traction for your pinkies as you're trying to kind of pull up in the knife. If you're pushing down to a lot of force on a knife, that's going to pivot the knife around your index finger. So the pressure is coming upwards here, and that's going to seesaw the knife downwards. So you are, you're actually having to grip with the back of your hand and you're able to kind of push like that, and so it's good to be able to have the back of your hand feel like it's not going to slide at all because you're going to be trying to putting a lot of force there. And it works really, really well for that. But the bigger thing that these both do is make it really easy to take this knife out of your pocket. Some people grip their knives like this as they pull out of their pocket. Some people grab their knives like this. And if you're this type of person, this, oh, I love that. These lock in perfectly and make it really easy to slide this out. Now, talking about uh, how it carries in pocket, this uh, pocket clip is actually really, really nice. It looks aesthetically a little bit like an afterthought because it's just a straight clip, but it actually does taper downward as we go. And so it isn't just as uh, like a plain boring stick. I also think that a, a straight line clip like this, while it kind of feels generic, does actually pair really nicely with a straight line knife like this. I think they could have done something like added this kind of ribbing along this texture there to kind of tie it in more or something. But functionally, it's actually a very nice clip. Uh, it's a, it's a mill tie clip, and those typically are not very deep carry, but this is actually really, really good in that regard. It uh, You basically get all the way up there. That's almost nothing. So that's that's really, really good. The other thing is that it has really nice um, ramp on both fore and 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 aft up there, right there, and so it has really nice tension. And so I found that this slid in out of my pocket really well, especially from gripping like that, and that it stayed in my pocket really well. So I think this clip worked really, really nicely. But the, the other thing is that I um, I don't feel it at all, and that's awesome. Sometimes when clips are milled high and they put them all the way at the back like this, because uh, there's just this kind of wedge there, sometimes you'll feel that and it'll jab you. Now this one. Uh, it does have this chamfer along the back that helps with that, but the bigger thing is it just, at least in my hands, doesn't, it doesn't stick out in a way that makes it noticeable. I, I, I worry sometimes that it will on knives like this if they're thinner at the back, and since this does thin down, I thought it might, but it, it just, it honestly doesn't. The other thing is, at least on my hands, this does not feel like a hot spot at the front at all. It falls right into the behind this little crest in my hand. And generally speaking, if a clip falls back here on this flat part, you're not really going to feel it. If it sticks up past this and pokes into this little rounded spot in your hand, then you'll feel it every single time. And for me, this is perfect. It's even further back. If your hands are even bigger, I think you won't have a problem with that at all. Uh, unless your hand's quite big, and then right there, then you might start feeling it. But I think this clip is is just great in hand. Speaking of other parts that have to do with carry, this knife is quite light. Um, it's it's perfectly hitting that ounce and inch mark. It's only 3.3 ounces, and it's a 3.3 inch blade. But the thing is, a lot of those knives that are hitting that ounce and inch mark have slightly different ratios than this in terms of where they're putting that weight. This actually has thick enough blade stock that's thick enough out to here that the, that that weight is largely at the front. So a lot of times that means a knife will be balanced back here, and this one is perfectly balanced exactly where you'd want it to be. This is dead centered, perfect balancing. And so the result is that this feels really, really nice in my hand. They were pulling that off by having really heavy skeletonization in here. You can see, look at that. It's just enormous pockets in front and back with this little stability line in the middle to add continue the strength. They do the same thing on the other side, 
really big pocket there, really big pocket there. And so I think I'm just, I'm quite impressed with how that works. Now I talked a little bit more about ergos. Um, this feels fantastic in a, in a, like a hammer grip and in a saber grip, but where I really love it is in this particular pinch grip. This is my favorite. Um, these curves back here line up my hand perfectly. This little round part right there, especially with this little lines, my thumb nestles in that so great. And this jimping is still right there, right where my finger is. So I love this. It feels so locked in in a pinch grip. You can choke up even further and have this hump right there curve into your hand and then put your finger all the way down to the tip. And this also feels great. So this is my ideal use case for this knife. Now, given his self-defense background, I'm not surprised at all that Dirk Pinkerton made a knife that feels good in other grips as well, but I will never hold in that way. So I'm not going to talk more about it. The only other thing I would say about ergonomics, it's not really an ergonomics thing. This is mostly going to be an aesthetic pet peeve, but I personally don't like when flat screws or really screws in general fall on a contour of the knife because it means they stick up right here. I said it as ergonomics because you do, you can feel it, but they did a better job by making these screws have a little chamfer on the edge of them so it's not as sharp. So you feel it and it does kind of rub. I don't I don't like that. Uh but it's not like it's sharp at least. To me it's mostly just just an aesthetic thing. It, it bugs it bugs me when when knives do that. This is coming in a kind of bronzy anodized version. If you go on Blade HQ it's just listed as gray and it looks here in their pictures. So I don't know. This is the version that they show on their beyond ADC knives.com website though. It's just, an, some people really love this color, but this as an anno job always kind of bugs me a little bit because you can see that with moisture in your hand or oils in your hand, it kind of turns this, this gray color. And I just, I don't know. It bugs me. It looks splotchy very, very quickly. You can also see that it has a little bit of snails already just from the other people who have passed this around. And so, I don't know. It's not, um, this is not a colorway that I would go for. I don't love the bronze and blue thing going on very much, but a lot of people are really into that. And it's a color combination that some people absolutely adore. So I'm not surprised that they did that. The last thing I want to talk about with this handle is access to this lock bar here. We have this little scallop right there. And I find that that makes this very easy to push over. Uh, it's not a huge gap. So some people might find trouble, but I think it's, I think it's plenty sufficient. I personally like when knives give you a little bit of recession on this side, that allows you to you know, push on the side rather than having to shove your finger down in to push on the side, but I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. The last thing I'll say about the handles, you can see that the handle itself is angled upward, or conversely, if you were to hold this straight, the blade edge is angled upward. Now, I personally don't love that on knives because it means that you have to tilt your wrist even further down to pierce with that tip, and that's how I frequently use these, but they do that on purpose because pulling this up like this gives you more clearance for your hand and makes it easier to make contact with the rear end of the blade. You'll see the exact same concept on something like the Spidey Chef. It's just even more exaggerated over here because they're really trying to make sure that you can use that entire blade edge. So it's not my favorite thing, but there is a purpose for it. Now let's talk about action because in some regards, this is a place where this knife really shines. And in some regards, it's not quite. Uh, it, the thumb flick is really nice. The reverse flick is really nice. And the fall home is guillotine. So what's not to love? The problem, and this is actually, I, I think the only true problem with this knife, the problem is how they're achieving that guillotine action and what impact that means on the detent. So the way that any knife is going to achieve free fall action is by having the, the pressure of this blade be less than the force of gravity on this knife. So this is a thick enough blade with enough uh, blade stock all the way at the end that the, the blade's reasonably heavy and has a uh, uh, center of gravity that's far enough out that gravity has a lot to work with here. But they still have to overcome the lock bar pressure. That's the number one thing that's going to slow it down. And they do that here by having this be quite a light lock bar pressure. And so as a result, you pair those two things together and it just free falls home. And that's, that's, that's awesome. It's a lot of fun to play with. And it's not, um, it's not so fast that it's like scary. But it's, it's, I don't know, it's honestly really, really fun and satisfying. So what's what's the problem here? That light lock bar pressure means that there is a little bit of an alignment problem with this detent. Let's, let's, uh, let's look at this real quick. I'm gonna zoom in. 
if you see right now, this is like what happened when it just closed. This is the case under normal circumstances. The moment this knife closes, this is how far the detent is going to be engaging. You see how there's a little bit of a gap right there and you can see the detent ball. The problem is, is if this lock bar was a stronger pressure, it would do this. Okay, see how it's all the way in now? That means that the size of the detent ball and the alignment of the detent ball with the hole and everything like that allows for this, but the pressure of the lock bar is not strong enough to actually achieve it. But if you just kind of hold the handle, sometimes you will will push that in. And what impact does that make? Well, it significantly changes the, the detent strength. So if I, okay, if I just let this close naturally, this is actually a very light detent. It's gonna be hard for me to do this under my camera, but it's very easy to flick that out. But if you just push this in, and I don't mean like push and hold, but just push it in once, now the detent is much poppier. And so if you push it in, now you, now you can't shake it out. And so what that means is that you can either have a detent like this, you know, it's not that this is like not poppy, but you see how it's like a little bit slow versus if I push that in, again, not holding it down, but just push it in, now it's a very snappy detent. And so I, I mean, it's just sometimes when you go to grab the knife, it has a, a soft detent and sometimes there's a strong one. And that's, that's not great. The other thing is that means that this is reasonably susceptible to lock bar pressure. If you push down on this and do hold, this just locks all the way up. And that's not great. I uh, This lock bar is luckily not terribly big and it is sloped down. So I find that it's not all that hard for me to keep my finger off the lock bar. But sometimes you have that happen. Like sometimes I just fail on this knife. And the problem what's going on here is that I need to be pushing more outward and the placement of these thumb studs makes it easy for me to accidentally push too far upward. And it's, it's, it's compounded by that, that detent strength that's sometimes being much harder. What I'm talking about here is that even though there is this contour, it means that you can get to the side of this stud. The, the fact that the stud is right up against the handle means that naturally my thumb often comes down here and tries to flick upward because that's the, the best place to get purchase on this thumb stud. And you want to be coming outward and not up. And sometimes, especially if this curls into my hand like this, I'll accidentally find myself pushing up like this, which is almost into the pivot. And that just doesn't work. And if this is pressed in, then it definitely doesn't work. And I'll just fail to deploy the knife. And so it can be kind of a frustrating experience. Now, in my personal experience, once you figure out how to flick this knife, and it doesn't take that long, it's actually quite pleasant. Especially, um, yeah, it is quite nice. And it is quite fun having it do that fall home like the way it does. And so I, I do find this knife kind of fun to play with. And if they were to increase this lock bar strength to the point where it, it was consistently going in, it wouldn't fall close like that. It wouldn't be quite as fun to play with. The last thing I want to say about closing action is that it's only about 11 degrees to get to that detent ball. So that's your detent ball engagement. And that means that you don't have to close it very far at all. We're going to be up on that detent ball and experience that kind of guillotine fall home action. I find it very easy to close when so doing it intentionally like that, but it also can fall to your nail. This little groove right here, that means is if you do put your finger where this notch here implies it should be, that will typically fall right there and land that way. And you're already up on that detent ball. If you do kind of pull back though, it is possible for that to slide past you. And then this can hit you there. Now that was a little bit scary to me at first because this is a heavy enough blade that I thought that that might hit my nail in a way that felt bad, but it didn't actually ever do that. This is just enough of kind of like a, a, a floating free fall that I never found that this actually hit me in a way that felt scary at all. Like usually it falls like that and sometimes it falls like that, but it just kind of bounces. I never felt like it was cutting me. So now in order to transition into my kind of general final thoughts, let's talk about fit and finish for a moment because I think they actually did a really nice job here. There are little micro chamfers absolutely everywhere. Little chamfer right there, little chamfers along the edge of the spine right here, chamfers along this entire back. There are no sharp corners left anywhere. And they did a, and as a result, that's just, it just feels really nice. If you look closely at the milling here, it feels really clean and crisp. Like they just, I think they did a really nice job. I compared it earlier to this knife, the Kaiser Genie, and I think it has pretty comparable level of fit and finish. And I, I say that favorably. Now, the thing is, this is a titanium S35EN knife that costs about 160 bucks. And this is a titanium S35EN knife that costs about 180 bucks. And so 
I don't know. I don't think that they're like super hard pushing the value proposition here, but they're not out of that either. I think for the price, this is a really, really nicely done knife. I think um, the shape and size is fantastic for me. I think if you want a sturdier kind of robust knife, oh, I, I forgot to mention that. The, the lockup on this, I was a little bit worried when I saw that this was a light lock bar pressure that it might have um, lock slip even, or even just feel weak or have some blade play. There is none. This is super bank faulty. And this is a thick enough blade sock that there's no wiggle or flex anything. So this knife feels really, really sturdy. And so I think that if you want a little bit of a more robust utility working knife that is, um, and this like is it falling into this kind of geometric shape with strong corners and things like that, I think this is actually a really nice option. I I think that they need to figure out their general tuning in order to be able to achieve this kind of effect, but not have the problem with the detent being sometimes soft and sometimes hard. I don't know exactly what they would do. I think they'd have to be a little bit more careful about their placement of the detent ball, all that kind of fun stuff. But at the end of the day, I actually really like this knife. Now, I personally am probably not going to pick one of these up, mostly because I just don't love the colorway. And the other thing is that I just don't have a need for a thicker, sturdy utility knife in my life right now because I just got in in the God of Mystery pre-order. And yeah, it's going to be a while before that comes to me, but that's going to fill this need completely for me. But I think if you are interested in this, this is a really nice option. So I'm really glad I got to check this out. I hope you guys like this and I'll catch you guys next time.